I'll have a highly opinionated talk on uh, on some of those uh, some of those uh, issues. So a little on me, I'm a senior engineer at uh, LEGO. Before that, I was working four years as a consultant doing uh, Groovy and Grails related uh, stuff. I'm an external associate uh, professor at the University of Southern Denmark. And last spring, I ran a Groovy Grails related course. I was offered to do it again this spring, but when we saw the population of students, mostly everyone had already taken that course. So we opted not to do it. We'll probably uh, offer it again next spring. Uh, I blog the, uh, the Grails diary. Uh, roughly once a week, and you can also find me on, uh, on Twitter having uh, various opinions, primarily on Groovy Grails uh, stuff. So, since uh, the, the future of the uh, Groovy ecosystem is, uh, is uh, in flux, and uh, I think most people around here know that this definitely happens, I, I just brought one, uh, one evaluation I got from, uh, from the course, half a year after I've, uh, I've taught it, and, and one of the students at least think uh, I don't think I'll ever move away from Grails in the future, being uh, one satisfied customer in, uh, in the ecosystem. So what are we going to do today? Well, I'm going to give a short introduction to uh, what am I doing in my daily work. Uh, and then I'm going to discuss some of the groovy technologies that we are using and to what extent we're using and what we're using them for. We'll also, once in a while, come on in on if we had not used the Groovy technology, what would we then have to have done? And just to for, for take, uh, foresee the future, yes, we're not using Groovy at everything. So I didn't Groovyify everything. Um, so my job is with Lego. And I started the year there a little over a year ago, 13 months. And that was at a uh, brand, new, uh, brand new team called SITMABIS. So the C. And IT is for corporate IT. So we're in the, the big department of IT at Lego that counts for around 500 uh, persons. There's another IT department at Lego that's called Digital Solutions. And I'm going to come back to uh, what the difference between those are. So the MA is for marketing. So we do support for marketing. And the BIS is where the fun part starts. We're business innovation solutions. That pretty much translates into Whatever they don't have another team for, we're, we're kind of first place they go. So, oh, where does this go? Go ask the, the special needs kids. That's us. Our sister team in, in SITMABIS is the big data team. So we have an official big data team. So at least there is a team for handling, uh, handling that. And we're the development part of this team. So We're seven full-time employees in uh, in. Uh, uh, in the technical field, and we have a, a manager who is also with a technical background who uh, once in a while uh, assists us, once in a while plays our own little chaos monkey. Uh, we have another team member that does an excellent job on, in case you could screw something up, he will definitely find out how we can do it. So we try to, tr try to make our solutions so that, uh, that even he cannot, uh, cannot break them. It's, uh, it's excellent to have that. And we have two, uh, two student workers on the team. We have a QA manager that's not included in the seven. He has a student worker also for doing, uh, doing some, uh, some testing. And we have a couple of product owners that is, uh, that is not included in the, in the seven. So the premise for our team was, well, we were hired based on JVM experiences. So the, we want to assemble a, a team that had JVM languages as the toolbox. And the premise was also we're working microservice uh, architecture. So pretty fast it came into uh, the premise that, all right, we dockerize all of our services, and that's the, uh, that's the common, uh, common thing. But JVM-based and microservice was pre-recruitment, so that was, uh, that was a premise on our team. Our current task is we're ring-fenced employees at Lego Education. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about, uh, about Lego and the organization. I assume everyone knows what it is. But Lego Education is the branch of Lego that does, uh, that does educational sets for, uh, for schools. So you cannot buy them in a, in a random store. You must, uh, must buy them through the channels that sells, uh, sells Lego sets to schools. That being said, the primary task for Lego Education is actually developing educational content. The revenue requirement for Lego Education is quite lower than it is for, for Lego, the toy part of the company. So, so this, this is part of what the family behind LEGO appreciates very much. So, so it's a little, a little pet project that they have there. Um, 
The current task at Lego Education is, and this is a little flurry, a new digital platform. That was the that was the task when we were going in, asking them. So, what do you mean when we say digital platform? Was a lot of aha. Oh, we have to specify that. So there is. A, I'm not gonna gonna reveal too much. But a few of my colleagues in Lego Education thought that if we develop the content as PDFs, it is very electronic. Uh, most of the uh, most of the uh, the uh, the personnel at Lego is uh, on the same side as us. That's electronics. It's actually something that's accessible on the web, doing some nice UX and uh, and, in, and experience. Things with the uh, digital platform is it must be global. So we have some of the core markets being the in, uh, the US, in Europe, and in Asia. So whatever platform we're building, we can't just have a service window where we have downtime. Must be. 24/7, and it must be high performant. When it comes to China, there's roughly 20 million school teachers in China. Another fantastic thing is that the uh, educational uh, ministry out there decides what tools are being used. So, in case they say we go with Lego Education, we have 20 million simultaneous customers, like a snap. Part of our other task is we do technical consultancy. So, whenever whenever Lego Education says Oh, could we do something like this? We at least, we at least being asked, is this remotely possible? Would would this require a huge pile of money, or is this a reasonable uh, criteria? So one thing we uh, we did as a proof of concept was we tried to service enable the compiler for the Mindstorms project. If you do that, you don't necessarily have to have a compiler for Android, for iOS, for Chromebooks, for any single platform. You could just use the network for it. It of course requires you to have network connectivity, so it may or may not be the best option, but it at least is possible. So the landscape from Lego Education is they have quite a few apps uh, of legacy code, and they want to build some uh, some new ones. And and when they say digital platform, part of this is they really want a unified experience on all of those apps with common login, common content storage, so you can access uh, access and use those services across the, uh, the portfolio. This including both the Mindstorms uh, robot and the apps for that. They have a smaller robot for middle school that's called WeDo that doesn't have that many, fun, uh, many functionalities as the Mindstorm, but it's pretty handy. And for, for all of the other products, I'm not an expert in the portfolio. Um, so some of the challenges I was facing uh, 13 months ago when I started was it was a brand new team. You say, oh, that's cool, it's a brand new team. Yes, but it also means learning a lot of new people and who has competencies in what and how do we distribute those competencies in, uh, in the team. It also means that, that half the team was hired first and we hired gradually and we tried to, to expand within the competencies that we, were, that we were missing. And for example, a DevOps resource was one of the latest uh, newcomers to the team and we kind of was missing that in the, in the beginning. So. We had to share some of these responsibilities, and I had to take over quite a few of those in, the, in a long period. So Lego, what they really do well is it's an enterprise uh, business. Planning a set of Lego bricks from the idea phase to the design phase to the production to marketing, it's a roughly two year span, and they do this really, really well. Trust me, they do also earn quite a quite a nice amount of money on it, so document it, this is really good. They run most of their software uh, development in the same way, and this works pretty good for internal, uh, internal products that is being used in a production plant. As soon as you take in customers and you let them use an app, first thing that happens once you launch is, first customer says, oh yeah, that's pretty good, but it would be nice if it also did like this. You don't do that in enterprise things. Once you're done, you're done. There's no more money for maintenance and stuff like that. So our team was really needed to, uh, on an agile scale. So we have a lot of initiatives being the enterprise platform versus the, uh, the engagement platform that is agile. We had some, uh, some challenges on should we start out with the on-prem data center? Should we go cloud? Uh, what technology should we use? And what is even the, uh, the stance on open source in a company like Lego? No one had really taken that up because, well, Lego's using SAP, stuff like that. Let's buy something fancy and expensive and it just works. Well, our team was kind of, well, 
we would maybe like to use a couple of other technologies open source. Good thing here is we've actually been allowed to use open source. We're allowed to contribute back as long as uh, we say, well, this, in case something breaks because of it, it's not Lego's uh, fault, which is, uh, I think, fair and normal. So some of the services that we produce is a new ID management system uh, to store account uh, things. Lego already had one of these, but not, not really optimized for educational purposes. So when you signed up for Lego ID, you could get the username Fluffy Bunny 77. A school teacher might not think that's the most appropriate username. There's a few other technical things that says, well, we need something that's more suitable for our need. So the backup and content storage, we, uh, we have done something with this. Configuration management of, uh, of apps. Sometimes you outface an app, you really want to, um, to make sure everyone upgrades. So you need some configuration management that whenever you start up an app, checks, is this app even valid or should I display a message that says, oh, you should definitely upgrade or down, uh, do something with, uh, with this app. So there's something, something needed for that. And we've done quite a few backend services for the web shop or uh, for the websites and, uh, and et cetera. So let's take a deep dive into the Groovy ecosystem and see where does this, uh, this bring us. And first thing, thank you very much, Marco Vermeulen, for doing the SDK man. I wouldn't be able to do Groovy development without you. I would be dead from manually type, uh, installing things and, uh, and switching versions. So the SDK man is great for, for installing everything. I hope you all know it, all use it. If not, you're, you're, your fault, your loss. So best thing is you can change versions. So even, uh, even if you have, even if we're working fast, for example, the Grails team, they do very, random, uh, very often releases, so switching, uh, switching releases from, uh, from one to another is, uh, is trivial with SDK man. There's even an SDK switch uh, extension, so it, it, it figures out exactly what version are you using. So all of, uh, all of the members on our team uses SDK man because it just really works. If we were not to use that, well, there's apt for Linux that has some of the technologies, doesn't support everything. There's brew for Mac. Uh, or you could make your own scripts like, uh, like back, in the, uh, back in the old days. Pros are, of course, this is extremely simple. It's very effective. It's easy. There are many te technologies. The only thing I hope for, uh, for SDK is, oh, it would be nice if we would also have the, SD, uh, the JVMs on it. And I know Marco want that too, but well. Oracle, you should do something about it. So, next technology, Gradle. There's a little, uh, little wind going with Gradle nowadays. I still like Gradle. Uh, this is our built tool of choice. Um, so, what we've done is we've built our own plugins for some of the tasks in our pipeline. So, we have a plugin that handles our entire release process and ver versioning. So, I don't need to know exactly what version am I in. I just need to know, do I want to release a patch, major or minor, and my CI server handles that when I invoke a job for that. It also figures out, am I on the right branch compared to some rules that, uh, that we've set up internally in, uh, in the team. Um, so our entire infrastructure is, uh, is now set up in, uh, in Amazon, uh, in AWS. Uh, we're, uh, we have scripted all of our infrastructure using a tool called Terraform, so it's pretty easy to do updates and, uh, and expand with a couple of extra servers if we, uh, if we need that. And all of our Docker containers is, uh, is orchestrated and deployed using a tool called Rancher. Rancher is... Uh, is we, we opted for Rancher uh, after evaluating them, OpenShift and Mesosphere. And Rancher is really easy and has so far done the job very, very good. So what it does is it, it runs out network agents within our virtual private cloud, handles our load balancing going in. So as soon as we have, we have SSL set up into the cloud, Rancher makes sure that everything runs IPsec within. So from a security point of view, we really like that. And it has a very nice API that is easy to communicate with. 
well, just because a REST API is easy to communicate with, I really prefer to have a Gradle, uh, Gradle uh, wrapped around it, so I can just configure it because Gradle, in my opinion, is way easier to throw at a continuous integration server and share with the other teams. All they need to do is upgrade their API keys to specify which environment are we doing and exactly what stack and what service do we want to, uh, want to deploy. So we built that on, uh, on top of, uh, of Rancher using, uh, using Gradle. So in general, our entire deploy pipeline and release pipeline is, uh, is, uh, is built using, uh, using Gradle. Works on, on all of the operating systems, and it's uh, pretty fast, it's pretty simple. There's a lot of plugins that, uh, that you can use. Andres over here is giving talks on exactly which of the, the plugins are recommended. If you haven't seen his talk, it's a, it's a magnificent example of uh, things I didn't even know, even though I've used Gradle for, for quite some time now. The only con I can say about Gradle is there's a few corner cases that it doesn't really support. For example, we have part of our team that wants to build stuff in Scala, and the newest version of the Play framework is not supported. When it comes to Groovy and the Groovy ecosystem, we have uh, pretty decent support. Like in, I think it supports just about everything. We could, of course, have opted for, for using make files. Those are a good battle-proven uh, proven technology. We would also have used the next technology I won't even mention. It's like Voldemort or something like that. We could have used Ant, or we could have used the worst built tool ever. There is pretty much a lot of different options, but I think Gradle is, is a lot better than most, uh, most alternatives. So this was a pretty easy, easy catch to sell to the team, so we use that on roughly all of our, uh, our projects. Grails. Mentioned, I was a four-year developer in, uh, in Grails before I started the Lego. So are we using Grails at all? Yes, of course. The very first thing we put into production was a uh, small service that uh, extracts the products that are relevant for Lego education, exposes them to the, uh, to the web shop that is built, uh, built uh, by an external company uh, in, a, in a framework called Sitecore. It also has the pricing and the inventory uh, feed for, uh, for the reason we're doing this is the internal integration in Lego is, is handed to us in a, in a MySQL database, and we need to do a little business logic on top of this in order to be able to expose it. And we didn't want uh, to uh, have that task uh, sent, uh, sent out to a, a, a company external trying to, uh, trying to handle that. We wanted to be in control of this also because in case we had an emergency upgrade or the feed was shifted, we don't have, ne have to necessarily uh, task that out to an external company again. We also have a couple of, of, of other internal tooling uh, systems. So we keep track of exactly which version is deployed at which time on which environment. So we built a small uh, Grails app. This was done by one of my, uh, my previous student, uh, student workers who, uh, who got into Grails development uh, pretty fast. It also keeps track of our documentation. And currently we're working on a QA uh, handover registration. So all of these different, uh, different apps for mobile devices, whenever they have to be submitted to, uh, to the uh, App Store in Apple or Google, uh, Google Play or the Windows App Store, there's a different set of requirements that should be, uh, should be in order when you submit them. And since those, uh, those apps most likely uh, are, are developed in, uh, by externals, well, what we want is for them to always keep it up to date on exactly what are the specific, uh, specific values of this. So, so this is a little internal tool, but it will uh, save a lot of Excel sheets from being mailed around. If we were not to do this in Grails, well, we could build this in, in just about anything, but in the JVM world, well, we could have gone with Spring Boot. We do have a Spring Boot uh, application uh, here and there. For, for reasons I'm not going to go into, but it's definitely not made by me. Um, we, have, we have a guy that, that, that thinks JVM technologies, that must be Java. So he's a real Java fan, and, and he does a great job on that. I, I just think he's writing a lot of code that, that I prefer not to write. We could also have opted to go with the Play framework in, uh, in Scala, who is also a full-stack framework and would have, uh, would have supported the job. I just think going with the with, uh, Grails, and, uh, and working with Groovy when you have uh, people that know Java is 
way easier and, and faster to get up and running than first having to learn Scala and a few of the, the tricks to get into, uh, into the play framework. So pros for going with Grails is it has a, an easy learning curve. So learning Groovy if you're a Java developer is checkmark. You're almost there. Uh, it's full stack. Really nice, and I think this is the best feature of Grails. It's also exported to be standalone as GORM. The, uh, the object relational uh, model from, uh, from uh, Grails with dynamic finders is really, really handy. Uh, so that was my choice for, doing, for selecting Grails for going with the, uh, with the feed to output from, uh, from the database where I had to select on, uh, on different logics. Um, and the rich plugin ecosystem is the reason why I think Grails is head over feet better than Spring Boot. Well, not everything is as positive as we would like it to be. So Peter Ledbrook, Jeff Scott Brown, whoever has written books on Grails, uh, couldn't you decide on who of you wants to do the strange task of upgrading so we have a book on Grails 3? It's really annoying that, that you can't just grab a book and give it to your student worker and say, well, look it up in chapter 4. You can do that with one of the old Grails books, say, all right, look it up in chapter 4, and then once you're done, I can tell you the, the slight similarities that is not quite as it is, it is in the book in the latest release. I do also think that for microservices, Grails, it's built on top of Spring. It is still a little heavy. It's a little heavy-handed tool. If you do, if you do a, a, a WAR file from Grails, you immediately get 50 megabytes. You don't necessarily have to use all the 50 megabytes. I'm fairly sure something could be better. And it's not reactive, which is uh, one of these things that we want to have nowadays. Which brings us to the next framework, Rat Pack. Rat Pack is a set of Java libraries for building modern HTTP applications. That was the selling, uh, selling line I stole from the Rat Pack documentation. Rat Pack is uh, reactive, and it has an excellent Groovy integration. So even a few examples that they've done in Java, I would have really have liked to have them directly in, uh, in Groovy. So we do have one Rat Pack app in production. And I know this is not everyone that said, oh, Rat Pack for production already. Yes, we, uh, we tried to, to opt for that, especially because we were in a hurry and we needed something that we were convinced could be deployed fast, could be developed fast, and could perform. So Rat Pack is highly performant. It, uh, it uses uh, Netty underneath and is really a nice task for this. So it's not a complicated application. What it does, it, it serves some, uh, some configuration based on a little environment uh, trickiness and, uh, and everything about it. It worked. It was developed in a couple of days. We, uh, we're satisfied and have no problems in going into production with, uh, with this. We could have gone for Akka HTTP, which is the Scala equivalent of, uh, of a reactive uh, framework. This could, uh, this could probably have solved uh, the task too. It would just require me to become a better Scala programmer. So I recommend Rat Pack from the point that it's fast, it's lightweight, it's reactive. And the only con I can say right now is, oh, the book is almost done, but it's just almost done. And we do need a few more people to actually blog when they find uh, nukes and crannies on uh, on Rat Pack. So Mr. Haki does a great job. I think he has uh, 25, 30 blocks by now, and his blocks is always of a, of a very high quality. But in general, there's, there's still some issues with the documentation. It is improving rapidly. So every month, the documentation improves immensely, and it's compared to a year ago when I, when I tried my first Rat Pack app, where it was really bumping my head through the walls, it's become pretty simple to do. So. The uh, API is stable now. They have a lot of nice, uh, lot of nice features, and uh, they have a monthly release. And everything, uh, everything from my point of view, is go slightly. I haven't compared them either, but I think those are fairly similar. My guess is it's within uh, within a few percent, but I haven't done any formal uh, formal testing of it. Yes, this was a very natural choice for, for my team. And as I see it, 
Anyone on my team knowing Java would be able to review my Groovy code. Anyone on a Java team is not necessarily able to review Scala code. Scala, I like Scala as a language. Now I've said it, please, uh, please stone me. I don't do much Scala programming because I also think the readability of Scala is not that pretty. You can write pretty Scala code, but it's not the general way people write Scala. Use Akka with Java? That might be. I'm, I'm not the uh, Akka HTTP uh, expert. Uh, we, have, we are using Akka HTTP for some of our projects, and it performs nicely in general, and, and it goes f uh, seamlessly fa uh, fast enough with development. So we could have opted for going, uh, going Akka HTTP. So one of, one, of the, one of the things that I presented was we're the business innovation solution team, which also means that we made an agreement as a team that we're not going to select a very narrow set of technologies from the beginning. We actually want to experience several different technologies and always use the, the most appropriate tool for the task. And luckily, our manager was backing us up in, the, in that decision because that's, I know for, in a lot of companies, that's not the general way you do it. You have a, a limited set of technologies and you become experts in those. And that, of course, is fine. But, but the, the, the happy developer, in my opinion, you get from the guy who gets to choose more or less his own technologies and those he, want, he feels comfortable with. At least I do. So even bigger, bigger success story in, in my team to press on is testing. When it comes to testing, I think Groovy has a bright future. I also think as a gateway drug, Spuck and Jeb are two of the technologies that is really easy to persuade a manager to, uh, to accept. First of all, it is test code, so it doesn't go into production. You get your team acclimated to Groovy by writing tests. And you have some capabilities in Groovy that you don't get out of the box with Java or Scala or Kotlin or many of the other technologies. And I know this is, uh, this is one of the points where we can discuss a long time because private should be private, so you shouldn't be messing with my private method. I, as a person, like to write small method. I also like to extract things into private small methods. And they should do one task and one task only. And I'm comfortable with testing a private method. And you can do that with Spock. You can do it in other frameworks if you like reflections and stuff, but in generally, Using Groovy where, well, private, you can write it, but it's not really private. Yeah, you can do it so easy that, that, that I recommend it. So Spark, I know you, I assume everyone knows it. If not, it's a technology I can recommend. It is the, in my opinion, the easiest way to sell in a real Groovy project into your team. So you have uh, testing. Out of the box, you have sparking and mocking, uh, stopping and mocking capabilities right out the box. And <laughs> I mean, using JUnit, the readability of a Spark test compared to a JUnit test is high. I feel like I'm being slapped on the, on the wrist every time I have to write a JUnit test. Even, even reviewing them is like, oh, this is tedious. You don't have to, to include Mokito and other mocking frameworks, learn new, uh, new, uh, new features of that. You have everything in, uh, in Spark. So our uses of Spark is with all Redpack, Rails, Gradle, plugin projects, anywhere right, where we use Groovy, we use Spark for testing. So we could have gone with JUnit. We have a few tests written in, uh, in JUnit. Uh, we have a lot of tests written in, in Scala test. You can test Scala code with Spock. We are doing experiments with it. I know some teams have had, uh, have had a very good success on that. Uh, there are libraries to convert Scala uh, uh, collections into Groovy collections for testing purposes. Uh, Marco Vermeulen uh, is, uh, is handling a project that grows over time to ex exactly do this. So we just, we just haven't had really the time to invest uh, deeply into that. And probably partly because I don't do much uh, Scala programming. So the pros of, uh, of Spark, as I see it, is it's very readable. 
and it gets you very well structured tests. You have uh, plugins that can format your uh, your test report exactly as you want them. So when you, whenever you have written your Spark test, you can output them so that any manager and non-technical guy would be able to understand exactly what you're testing. I haven't seen anything similar for JUnit. Uh, it can be used for multiple languages, and it is not production code. So if, if you haven't used Groovy in, uh, in your company before, or would recommend someone to get started with Groovy, not being production code is, is one of the things that, that should, be, should be sellable to a manager. The, the only con is, well, yeah, you have to learn Groovy as a language if you don't know it, and you also have to learn a little new syntax for Spark. The syntax being very, very light and very readable, so, yeah, it's a, it's a cheap con. I mentioned before, Spark as part of it, Jeb is the other half. Uh, Jeb is the uh, functional testing framework for browser automation. It's one of, uh, one of my favorite tools. It's built on top of WebDriver and Selenium 2.0. Uh, it does a really nice job of extracting uh, low-level uh, low WebDriver uh, APIs away. Um, so definitely my favorite tool for, for browser automated testing and, uh, and functional test. We use it uh, along with the Source Labs plugin. So we have a nice Gradle integration with, uh, with Source Labs, which means you can have just about any browser available to test on that you want to. And you can run this from your, uh, from your CI server. Uh, Satyr here will, uh, will demonstrate the use of Jeb tomorrow, I think. Isn't it? Today. today, later today. So if you, if you haven't seen Jeb before, if you didn't attend my talk at this conference last year, just definitely, uh, definitely visit, uh, visit his, uh, his talk. So our usage is our Q&A manager and his, uh, his people are using this for all the end-to-end -end tests. So whenever we just consider the application as a black box and we want to, uh, want to, uh, to use it like any, uh, any regular user would, automating it with, uh, with Jeb is the way to go. So a lot of people have, have tested that says, all right, so I need to check, verify all of these points. And you develop a couple of new features, and they go through the list again. And you develop a couple of new features, and they go through the list again. You don't have to be a really bright computer scientist to know, oh, that's n squared. This, 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 this just doesn't scale whenever we develop rapidly. If you do it with, uh, with Jeb and you automate your test, you don't really see it. You can run them whenever, whenever you want, on every commit or once in, a, once in a while. It does take a little longer to run. so. The pros, as I see it, is it uses Spark, so it's very readable. You have uh, pages and modules, so you do a really nice uh, maintainable structure. So in case someone changes something in the DOM, gives a new class, changes a uh, change thing around, sets up things, all you need to do is go into your pages and your modules and update the element that you're interacting with. It gives a very high degree of maintainability. I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, JavaScript uh, technologies that does the same, that doesn't have the same, uh, same nice, uh, nice features in, uh, in modularities. So the cons, it's kind of a con for every functional testing framework around, it is inherently brittle. But it also gives me the best feeling when I know that my customer can use my application exactly like they're supposed to. And even like they're not supposed to, that fails in a, in a controlled manner. All right. So, Groovy, my good friend. I've been talking about Groovy technology, so, so why would I want to use Groovy? I'm not going to answer that. You all know that, hopefully. If not, what are you doing here at GreatConf? So, the current projects with uh, Groovy is all the Grails and Ratpack components, of course. We're also writing Grails, uh, Gradle plugins using Groovy, and we use the Jenkins uh, Groovy DSL for, uh, for uh, our CI pipeline. And we're using Groovy many, many more places than people actually expect. The latest place was we had some Jira configuration where you can use Groovy to do some of the, uh, some of the, uh, the stuff there. Um, so this is one of the tricky slides. So what was the alternatives? Yes, we could go with Java. Java 8 is a pretty decent language. They've gone, you know, 
head over heel better than, uh, than back in the days. We now have lambdas, not as powerful as, as groovy closures, but at least it, uh, it goes better. We could go Scala way, and yes, our team is using a lot of Scala. We have some Scala developers. They are fanboys, uh, sorry, they are enthusiasts. Um, or we could, of course, have gone with Clojure or Kotlin or whatever. So we didn't, uh, we didn't really do that. So I would say the pros of going Groovy is it is very elegant and it's less verbose than Java. It is very readable. The learning curve is really small. Uh, the con is, and that's what I'm hearing from the team, it's not purely functional. I'm comfortably with not working purely functional, uh, but it is one of the, uh, the directions that, that current development, at least my team, is, oh, we want things to be purely, non, uh, purely functional, so we don't keep any state. It makes it a lot easier to scale. And I agree, it does. But all it takes is you as developers to be a little more restrictive in how you program. We have most of the capabilities that uh, they're bragging on, we have them in Groovy. So I always get, always hear, oh yes, but it's a dynamic language. That is true, but it's also only half of the truth. It's also a statically typed language if you wanted to. Annotate your class with compile static and you're there. So to, uh, to sum up a little bit here, uh, are we Groovified? Yes. We are groovified. There is a lot of technologies that is easy to uh, easy to sell to management. If I if I didn't have a manager that would accept multiple technologies, I think that that Spark and Jeb are the ones we would definitely have gone with, including Gradle. I think Gradle is a is a default built tool for anything that that's new and modern. If you don't want to go the Maven way, which I can't believe anyone would. Um, there's a couple of honorable mentions. Uh, the Betamax project, originally started by, uh, by Rob Fletcher, is one we're really considering using. It has gotten some love lately uh, and has been updated. And I need to mention GrooveScript just because I think it's a really fancy, neat project. I'm not sure we'll ever be able to use it in production, but GrooveScript takes uh, Groovy code and, and transpiles it into, uh, into JavaScript code. Uh, I think it's neat. And I want to support you. Um, so that's that's part of the uh, that's part of my presentation, and I'm hoping that uh, that we can also have a discussion on who has uh, who has good and bad experiences in including uh, Groovy into their own uh, their own company. So, any comments? I could easily see that as, uh, as one of the things we would like to open source. So right now, it, it only supports a very limited subset of, uh, of the uh, Rancher API, especially that supports exactly the things that we need right now. But it's, it's a clear candidate for, for being open sourced. And Lego has, uh, has uh, approved us that it's OK that we A, contribute to open source, and, and could open source some of our, our projects if they're in general enough. You say that your team is uh, 70 people and, and you're using different languages. Does that mean that every person gets to choose what tool they want to use and what, what language they want to play? In, in the premise that it is JVM based except our front ender who gets to uh, he he gets uh, he gets a little special treatment there um, peace with that but let's say that a person made a microservice in, in Scala or something and later on the teams uh, quite maybe maybe so does that mean that he's the same the same guy who has to make this change so he kind of owns the service or are you able to have somebody else write it even though it's not in their area so for now we have we have ownership so it's, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, motto is, you build it, you run it. So in case something breaks down, you're the guy we call. This, uh, this also uh, increases uh, the happiness of testing, I think. Um, but yes, um, so part of it, yes, if you build it, you run it, you upgrade it. 
but what we are divided into uh, into teams with or sub teams with different competencies if i had to i could probably upgrade a a scala application don't quote me on that back home with my manager i prefer not to uh, and i'm fairly sure that uh, that most guys on my team would be able to make changes in any uh, groovy related project uh, so far, no one has uh, has opted to go for Kotlin closure or whatever. Uh, I think the idea is that if we take in another language, we at least need to have some formal training in it, or at least someone who claims I'm an expert. I would be able to teach you how to uh, how to program it. Uh, CodeNark, we actually put those up on a couple of, uh, of projects, but haven't been consistent in, uh, in using, uh, using it. We should do that. We do have, uh, we do have user stories on creating, uh, creating a very specific set of those are the CodeNark rules that we wish, wish to use, and the same with ScalaCheck. It's a clear candidate where our team is quite opinionated when it comes to that, so I think we would make an, happily make an extension to the CodeNark plugin in Gradle that includes our own rules so that you wouldn't be able to, oh, this is an annoying rule, I don't want to, I can just replace it. So you just include the plugin and it has the configuration. I think that's, that's, that's part of our, our way of working that if you don't need to, to upgrade configuration, that's a, that's a good thing. Then we would rather upgrade it for, for all of your projects and you could use the latest version of it. G contracts. I don't think we have we have made any any plans on using it, but could be. Static files. Uh, no, the, the reason why we had to do the Rat Pack app, or we actually had to do something, was uh, it was actually a project that already existed in house, but based on an external partner's usage of it, uh, the course headers were set in a wrong way. So, in the application that was supposed to use it, the framework they were using for it could not access the configuration, which was kind of a moot point. So after quite a, quite a bit of emailing back and forth between the maintainers of the project, we opted to say, all right, we can, for this specific app, we can insource that project and upgrade it within a day or and a half. And it was not realistic to have the changes made because no one could really figure out where in the process were those headers dropped. So that was, the, that was the basic for it. And this also being that, that the configuration is, if, if you want to update the configuration, we redeploy. It was some proxy that, uh, that apparently didn't, uh, didn't forward the, uh, the uh, core setters correctly. But we, we, we were not really, I was not involved in the process of debugging it. But, but for some reason, we didn't find the right location where, where something went wrong. And, and the default choice was, well, we are going to take over this project anyways at some point in time. So we just jumped to that conclusion that it should be now instead. And Red Pack seemed like a really decent choice for it, because any time someone starts up an application, they'll have to check out the configuration. And being high performant, being uh, being very limited in uh, uh, being high performant and uh, and easy to deploy, fast to develop in, it seems like a like a good choice and very lightweight. I made my first Groovy extension as the core setters project, based on a blog post by I think Mr. Hockey.
Sure. Um, so to sum it up, uh, yes, the DSLs, fantastic features of Groovy, making your own DSLs. The uh, configuration slurpers and the builders. I think Ken mentioned uh, mentioned some of these uh, these points in his keynote this morning. Those are some of the really easy selling points. If you just have Java in-house, there's really some things where Groovy can make your life a lot easier. And it is just to get the first few lines of Groovy into your project. Once that happens, you do have Groovy all on the class path, and it spreads very fast. It's the reverse, op uh, reverse broken window. Once you have Groovy in, it starts spreading the love. All right, is there a final question? I think we're more or less out of time. All right, well, thanks for attending.